It's the World This Week, the World This Week in partnership with the Daily Beast, Borzu Dargahis, international correspondent for The Independent. How are you, sir? Good. Great to see you. Great to see you as well. Great to see uh, independent journalist Aisha Ghul. Sir, how are things? Okay. Just okay. <laughs> for now. Just okay for now. Elsa Vidal uh, cracks the whip with an iron fist in a velvet glove at the Russian language service at Radio France International. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Right. Despite the war. Despite the war, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, with us as well, Nicholas Norbrook, managing editor at the Africa Report. Your cover story this month? President of Kenya, Uhuru. No, not Uhuru. <laughs> um, we, we have, in fact, several presidents on the cover. We have uh, Hichilema from Zambia, and we have the president of Kenya as well. William Ruto. William Ruto. Many, th many thanks for being with us. You can listen, by the way, like, you can listen, listen, like, and subscribe to The World This Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. Where were you at 2.27 a.m. Moscow time on Wednesday? Mm -hmm. A first, then a second unmanned craft shot down over the Kremlin. No arrests so far, but hours later, it was already an open and shut case. And just as signs uh, went up on Red Square forbidding drones, state media was in overdrive, blaming Kiev for carrying it out on orders from Washington, it said. Elza Vidal, what was your initial reaction to this story? I was a little bit annoyed, honestly speaking, because the, um, the foot, the, the, the footing, the footage, sorry, were kind of disturbing because, of course, we saw these two drones, but flying above the Kremlin per se was so surprising. It's not supposed to be an area when you can fly a drone. It's supposed to be bugged. Usually you cannot even try to approach such an object. And without your drone being bugged and uh, absolutely... Okay, it confuses people's GPSs and tells yes. them they're in a different and location. You lose and you just lose the control over the items. So we were so surprised, when I say we, I mean other observers, we were so surprised that first it was possible to access the area with a drone, then to fly the drone over the Kremlin, and then finally to see that the explosive were absolutely small, speaking of the charges, and then that the, and again, that the drone themselves had been shut down by people on the roofs. Do so, I sense a bit of skepticism in your voice? <laughs> Are you suggesting this is a false flag operation? Oh, of course, this is one of potential explanation, but it's not the one I would go for. It's, mm. it's more because it casts such a um, bad shadow over the Kremlin, so to speak. I mean, it shows that Russia's power is absolutely not able to protect the most sacred land in the country. So I wouldn't go for that, but I would say it's probably a warning or an attempt by um, internal resistance, supporters of Ukraine, that would show um, that they are able to target the Kremlin to make them look ridiculous. And it reminds me a little bit of previous action undertaken by an artist and politics group, which was called Vaina, which means war, who had painted um, a penis on the... Um, in front of the K FSB, sorry, uh, building in St. Petersburg names, yeah. on uh, one of the bridges of the, of the city. And when the bridge would come up in St. Petersburg, then you will have a gigantic erection of a penis in front of the FSB. And every, everyone were laughing out very loud. So When it, was this? It was, I think, in uh, the middle of uh, the... Well, probably 2010, something like that. And the group Vaina has been prosecuted so far. Its member had to leave the country. Well, what I mean by that is either supporters of Ukraine cause, whether they are Russians or, or just Ukrainian, dissidents, or just a group of activists that would love to cast a very special shadow over the Kremlin. I, I do agree. I, I also don't buy the idea this is a false flag just because... You know, on, on the eve before this very important celebration to have these drones flying over the most sacred parts of the political uh, firmament in Russia is a very, very bad look. And, you know, Putin had been boasting that he'd put all these rings of panzer 
anti-aircraft uh, defense rings around the capital. You can't boast that your airspace is inviolable and then the next minute you've got drones overhead. It doesn't look good for Russia. Okay, let me argue the point, just play the devil's advocate here for a second. Russia's uh, foreign minister toning down uh, the initial rhetoric, uh, there was uh, the former president, Dmitry Medvedev, mm. calling for the elimination of uh, <laughs> Volodymyr Zelensky. This is him speaking earlier this Friday at the sidelines of a regional summit in Goa, India. Sergei Lavrov serving up a whiff of uh, menace along with a loud us versus them message. Mm. It's clear that without the knowledge of their minders, the terrorists from Kyiv could not have carried out the attack. We will respond not by talking about whether it was a casus belli, but by concrete actions. Okay, a little threat thrown in there, I guess, I guess towards Washington, uh, but presumably. Uh, Borzo Dargahi, um, does it serve the Kremlin's interest to say we're under attack and not by Ukraine, but by Washington? I mean, it might serve their interest with certain hardliners who already support them. I don't think it, they, the society could be any more mobilized than it already is at this point, any more militarized. Um, if you step back, uh, this was a war that was meant to be, you know, really quick. Uh, it was supposed to show Russia's emergence as a great power status. Um, you know, great countries, analysts told me, uh, was this was Putin's thinking. Great countries uh, like the U.S., great powers conquer other countries, just the way the U.S. conquered Iraq. And Putin took exactly the wrong message from uh, the actions of the U.S. and didn't look at the fine print, is that when you... Uh, launch a war like this, there's going to be blowback. There's going to be problems at, at home. There's going to be uh, 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 dissidents at home. There's going to be, this is who, regardless of who was behind this attack, um, this is just more and more evidence, along with a whole bunch of other things that are happening on the security and political front uh, in and around the Kremlin that shows that, you know, these kinds of conflicts, this kind of war of choice is never without costs and never easy and will blow back in, in your own backyard. I should go search. It, it, it's almost sounding like a... Uh, is he threatening me? <laughs> <laughs> is that what it sounded like? No, but but, but it, look, in times of, it's been what more than fourteen months now that that mm -hmm. the, this war has been going on. So, uh, just like the key date that you mentioned, which is May 9th, where it it's supposed to show its greatness and grandness, Russia and Putin usually, where it will show the the strength of its military force, and of course. The customary thing is for Putin to give a speech. So it is possible to, that there was maybe from an act from activists or inside the country or from powers from the outside to humiliate Putin even more before this big date. It's 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 a war where it shows that there are many ways to be engaged in this war, be it with words, be it with drones that do little sparks, but that ended up killing more than 23 Ukrainians as a response from the other side. So um, everything is being used uh, at this moment in order to sh to try to show who's got the power. Yeah, as you say, uh, it's uh, a ground war and an information war in The Hague, home to the International Criminal Court. Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukraine's president, insisting he prefers due process to hit jobs. Of course, we all want to see different Vladimir here <laughs> in The Hague, the one who deserves to be sentenced for these criminal actions right here in the capital of the international law. And I'm sure we will see that happen when we win, and we will win. Yeah, it, it, uh, he's speaking English uh, like he did it the, the day before in Helsinki. Uh, Borsu Dargahi, uh, of course, it's also a reminder um, uh, that uh, there's that spring counteroffensive that's been billed, and he's uh, trying to rally the uh, support from NATO allies. I mean, this is going to be a, you know, m momentous few months in the Ukraine war. Uh, most likely there's, on the one hand, um, uh, a, a real effort on the part of both Russia and Ukraine and their various backers to break out of the stalemate. On the other hand, you have 
Uh, China, uh, whose efforts at diplomacy actually are more welcomed by the Ukrainians than they are by, you know, uh, Washington and London and, and other Western capitals. Uh, getting China getting restless, getting frustrated. This war is uh, not as Putin sold it to them. Uh, you have other uh, world uh, regional powers under pressure uh, politically, internationally to take a position. So uh, I think that that is going to be one of the key things about the upcoming uh, spring offensive. Uh, reg regardless of who wins uh, on the battlefield, the the perception of who is headed toward victory will uh, kind of push various countries uh, into making uh, their positions much more clear. Yeah, the, 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 the optics are important. And as Aishigul was saying, uh, Russia's drones are continuing to rain down on Ukraine. Ukraine, by the way, which is also using drones quite effectively, it seems. Uh, with uh, strikes in the past week on oil refineries, supply lines in Crimea, and on the other side of the Kerch Strait. Uh, uh, and while uh, Kyiv's much of uh, vaunted uh, counteroffensive remains in the future uh, for now, uh, there's, the, there's the damage done. Uh, uh, and uh, again, that is also a, a factor. Ukraine's gotten pretty good, despite that the... the the, the, those missiles falling on a supermarket and a train station in Kherson the other day uh, has gotten pretty good at intercepting many of those. Uh, yes, definitely. They usually intercept about 80 percent of them. So the airborne defense is really quite efficient, but they are now in need of much more support on the side from their Western allies. And that's what now the outcome depends on. It's the, basically the weak point and also to a certain extent, the positive factor in this war for Ukraine to win is the, are the Western allies. So we have to be certain of what kind of support we want to provide them with. And it seems it has already taken far too long for us to make up our mind. I mean, when I say us, I mean the decision makers among Western allies. But Ukraine has been doing very well, and especially on the drone issue, they have been transforming their industry into, well, they have been producing a lot of local champions to produce drones of various generation, from the smallest and the easiest to maneuver drones to the most sophisticated who belongs exclusively to the army. So those who have been mentioning the biggest drones who have been carrying on attacks within Russia on airborne bases or on fuel, um, sorry, on fuel warehouses, then they, those were extremely large drones who look alike planes. They are not to be e easy to be maneuver, and you cannot do it on your own. It's strictly military operation. But then you have a lot of different operation with small drones, and they look alike those we have been involved in the mm. Kremlin attacks. So now we are we have a very large large span of action that encompasses the use of drones, and that's the new feature of war. So that's why we have also we Western ally we have to catch up on these because it seems that no day's war are going to be planned and won thanks to drones. I absolutely agree. And it's, it's really a, a question of data. And it might explain why the Chinese are getting so frustrated and, and a little bit concerned about this as well. You can be sure that the, the, the US companies and the US military, who are also involved on the battlefield uh, in Ukraine, are taking you know, huge terabytes of information every day from every drone strike, uh, which is done in a semi-formal capacity by the Ukraine military and by all the other operators in there. The U.S. have got some new loitering munitions which circle around the battlefield mm. using AI to identify targets. You know, in, in the, you know, the coming war in Taiwan that everyone is so worried about and which may, may not happen at all, and, and we all hope it doesn't, um, that would be a battle of drones and data. The, the, they've been using drones in the water to attack Russian ships. It's exactly the same thing. So the, 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 where things are won and lost are how much data you can get in from real battlefield situations. And you can bet your bottom dollar the Americans are getting a fair amount. And there's this contrast between um, 21st century technology and what looks like a World War I battlefield right now. Yeah. Uh, in Bakhmut, it's been likened to the Battle of Verdun, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, where the head of the Wagner paramilitaries has a message for the Russian defense minister and the head of the armed forces. 
These guys are from Wagner. They died today. Their blood is still fresh. They came here as volunteers and they're dying so that you can get fat in your wood panelled offices. We have an ammunition shortage of 70%. Where's my ammunition? <laughs> It's the F word, but in Russia. It's the F word, but in yeah. Russian. Uh, B word. Uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, by name, uh, yeah. calling out uh, the defense minister and the head of the army. Exactly. Is this theater, though? It's a little bit of theater, but it's, it's over-dramatized. But it's true. What is true is that they are, they, Prigozhin, uh, and Shoigu, and to a certain the extent, defense minister. the defense minister, and to a certain extent, Gerasimov, also, they are competing within the same system for resources that are limited. So access to those resources, ammunition, logistic change of support, he's to be fought for. And this is done over social media. Yeah, why not? Absolutely, because uh, it has to be, you know, the war is in everyone's head. So the battle for support is being fought with the support of the Russian citizens because at the very end of the day, it's very normal guys who are going to fight there. And for, for Wagner especially, you can just register as a volunteer. So you have to fight for your image. And what is doing Yevgeny Prigozhin is also protecting very much uh, his personal position within the system and Vladimir Putin by putting the blame on the defense ministry for the um, non-victory that is happening. If you're in the West, it's so hard to, 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 to get your head around the idea that, uh, uh, that different branches of the military would uh, lay their dirty laundry out in public. No. Yes, but uh, at the same time, the time. Ju just a I was just going to say, uh, quick parenthesis, and then I'll, I'll let Boris say, is, is that you mentioned 21st century. This is a part of the war game. It goes from so by social media. Don't exactly. forget that the, in the U.S. for four years you had someone called... Oh, Trump, who okay. actually run the White House and the whole country on social media. And the war today is not only on the ground, it's also done on social media, but also by, via propaganda, disinformation, and through the regular media that we kind of represent, which is the most valuable, dear audience. I mean, I think we shouldn't exaggerate the importance of these newer technologies. As you noted, this is a you know, 20th century, even to some extent, a 19th century uh, war being fought. And um, if you listen to the generals, if you, you know, the, the, uh, the former uh, uh, NATO commander had an op-ed piece uh, earlier this week in uh, Bloomberg, where he talked about, he did not talk about social media, he did not talk about drones. Ukraine needs munitions. They need good old-fashioned uh, shells. They need ammunition. And they need uh, Western industries to mobilize. And that is really uh, uh, the question, can uh, Western arms manufacturers get enough? I mean, there's a huge problem coming up. There was a big announcement out of, out of Brussels this week about the, the ramping up uh, munitions. R ramping up munitions that. to compete against uh, Russia's considerable um, a pool of labor and uh, uh, raw materials, you know, steel and so on, and its industrial base. So that is really going to be a big question in terms of who will, yes, we can talk about information war, we can talk about drones, which, you know, by the way, Russia misuses the drones, Ukraine uses the drones to, to try to win uh, uh, footage and, and fo feet on the battle lines, but you, Russia basically uses those Iranian-made drones mostly to terrorize uh, uh, Ukrainian civil civilians, you know. So there's a huge qualitative difference. But what is going to make the difference in this spring offensive is going to be uh, who has more firepower. Who ha will will t Ukraine get more HIMARS? Will they get uh, the air support that they want and they have requested? And the jury's still out, you're saying. In a parallel universe, Turkey, by the way, is still brokering a rollover of the grain export deal between Ukraine and Russia. The UN uh, this Friday saying uh, the negotiations aren't going well. Uh, it's not so easy, in fact, to get the two sides in the same room these days, as evidenced on Thursday when in Ankara, the two sides scuffled in and outside the parliamentary assembly of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. 
Got a little ugly. The Speaker of uh, Turkey's Parliament had to uh, bang the gavel to call to order on quite a few occasions there. Uh, those delegates might have noticed while in Ankara that uh, there's an election going on in nine days in Turkey. But it's not all rough and tumble in Turkey's election. What with a secret weapon unearthed by the man vying to unseat the country's leader of two decades. Kemal Kilic Dorulu, a.k.a. Mr. Boring to some, going viral with his kitchen counter talks to drive home, onion in hand, how Recep Tayyip Erdogan's policies are driving the country off the cliff. Uh, Ayşe Gul Sert, uh, they, they love it. Well, he's, he's, it's interesting, all these name-calling of Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, Erdogan call, you, you just mentioned the Mr. Boring, uh, Erdogan, pre Turkish President Erdogan this week called it bye-bye Kemal, bye in Turkish means Mr. bye-bye, goodbye. Um, it's it's all a part of the populism in politics today of, of name-dropping, of name-using. Kılıçdaroğlu is doing something in Turkish history which has never been done before. It's bringing together a coalition that has been, despite everything that we can say, to bring together six different parties from left to right um, of the political spectrum in Turkey to stand, it's been a year, to be the candidate facing the man who might be actually on his way to the exit. Um, if we follow the polls, and in Turkey you should never follow the polls because never anything goes according to normal. So he's the man, I would call him the man of hope. Some call him Mr. Turkish Gandhi, which I do not agree, but there's something very peaceful about him. And it is time in Turkey after 21 years of basically brutality, violence, intellectuals, writers, journalists, lawyers, activists who's been, who've been uh, incarcerated, just like in Russia that we uh -huh. talked about, it is time that there's finally a, a soft-spoken leader that says, I'm here not to cut you off, but actually to bring you together. And this onion that you mentioned is the new symbol. Turkey, those nine days is all about is all about uh, symbols. Um, the onion represents the fact that the, the high inflation, the fact mm. that Turkish money lira has no more value, and things that people can no longer um, afford to buy. Well, let's talk about communication strategy. So there's uh, Kilic Durolu talking about uh, uh, kitchen counter issues. Uh, Erdogan opting for more standard political communication, uh, accusing his rival of colluding with the outlawed Kurdish militants of the PKK, headquartered in the Kandil Mountains near the Iran-Iraq border. Evet, bye bye Kemal. Yes, Mr. Kemal. Your friend is Kandil, and you are on this path with them. But, Mr. Kemal. On May 14th, this holy nation, these dear citizens of mine, will turn the ballot boxes into a grave for you. Are we ready for this? I just, let's, let's be fair, you know, I mean, Erdogan accuses his opponents of being terrorists in every single election, every single one. And then afterward, he's like, you know, the rhetoric got a little heated, let bygones be bygones. So I, I kind of discount that. What was more disturbing was his comments that um, uh, Turkey, the Turkish people will never hand power yeah and on may 1st on may 1st he said my people will not hand over this country to a president supported by the pkk and what does that he is mean? because because the kurds are endorsing him much to his chagrin uh, much to his worry uh, the kurds uh, the the left leaning uh, faction of the turkey's kurds who are who arguably have the best ground game politically in the country like they're the most organized most politicized they have put their full effort behind Kilis Daroglu. That is really frustrating. That is messed up uh, Erdogan's plans. Erdogan has often tried to court. So, what are you suggesting here? That he's not going to go disturbing. quietly if he loses? That is disturbing. His interior minister also said he described the May 14th elections as a coup by the West. And this is, 
you know, this is the, the part that has worried a lot of analysts, this worry that if it is a very close election, he will contest it. Uh, regardless of the results, he will, you know, call foul. He'll, you know, say what he wants. This, this is new rhetoric that he won't accept. The, he's literally saying that he won't accept the results. And he said that, in, and his surrogates have said that in a number of ways, and that is rather disturbing. Of course, he's done that before. We saw him uh, annul uh, municipal elections, uh, and when they had a revote, he lost even even worse. But this is different. This is presidential elections, Nicholas Norman. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say we're in slightly uncharted territory if, if that's what happens. It's hard to see what the reactions will be on the ground in Turkey if he suddenly either annuls the elections or if there's huge electoral fraud and he waves it through. Um, you, you'll tell me how strong the courts are and, and what kind of resistance uh, would be put up from those institutions. Um, but I, I would say, yeah, all, all bets are off. And it, it's, I mean, 20 years is obviously an, an incredibly long time to be in power. And when they arrived, it, it seemed that they had transcended this era in the 80s and 90s, this uneasy bouncing around between Islamists and, and, uh, and the generals. And there was this transcendence. Suddenly there was this Islamist party, it was technocratic, and they were going to fix things. And, and in the early years, perhaps the economy worked quite well. I don't know how much of that was... Erdogan and how much of that was, you know, China pulling the world um, as it did at the, in the beginning of the 2000s. Um, but in the last 10 years, it's hard to see that he's really got any, any more supporters on the ground. Well, for me, it's quite a surprise that it comes that um, Erdogan may not be re-elected and this coalition just behind one leader is also a game changer. And I, I keep wondering whether the earthquake and the terrible uh, cost in terms of human lives has uh, helped in bringing together the people or to unite behind just one leader. And I'm also thinking of how this election could change geopolitics. Because if I go back to Ukraine's war, then it means that Turkey's new leader could be pursuing a completely different road and uh, what position will will he adopt? Mm. Because it, it will be a he uh, in front of Vladimir Putin. So will, I will, keep... will NATO continue to be the awkward, uh, will Turkey continue to be the awkward one inside uh -huh. of NATO? If, uh, if the opposition wins? The opposition... No, because the opposition is closer to the West, is turning more to the West than to, 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 to the United States. But this question that you asked about Russia and Ukraine can also be asked about what will be international politics that Turkey will follow mm -hmm. uh, in terms of Syria and Libya, uh, and Libya as well. Will, will there be a normalization with Syria if the opposition comes? What will happen to the more than four million refugees that are on the Turkish, on the tur Turkish ground? All this, look... The, the question that Nicholas asked is, is, is very valid and, and important. How strong are the institutions today mm. in Turkey after 20 years of power, and especially of power that has been abused of in terms of rule of law, in, her, in terms of judges? But you have also a population, 64 million, who will be voting on the 14th of May, who no longer can afford to eat and we are at three months after the, the, the um, earthquakes that shattered the country. And there are a lot of divisions. So even if he doesn't, Erdogan doesn't lose because of it, if he, if he loses, uh, if he wins these elections, I think it will be because of fraud and because those institutions were not solid enough to bring the rule of law. If he, if he uh, wins, maybe it will be a win but he will not be able to go on for a long time like this because he does no longer have the support of the of what he used to have even five years ago. Yeah, I mean, the, the cities have turned against Erdogan in a major way. The city of Istanbul, which propelled him to national prominence as, as mayor, uh, the city of Ankara, not to mention the, the co cities of the, the major population centers on the western co coast of the country, um, They've, it, 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 as one analyst put it to me, already, whether he wins or loses, we're already approaching the post-Erdogan era. Mm. He's not going to, uh, his, his popular base has not expanded. Can he, uh, using the YSK, the uh, Supreme Election Court, using the courts, using the media, which, uh, according to one analyst, he controls 90% of the broadcast, he and his allies control 90% of the broadcast media, can he... Uh, 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 stuff ballots? Can he discourage people from voting? Can he intimidate people enough to win a, you know, vote that is clean enough for uh, the U.S. and 
uh, uh, the EU to somewhat endorse? Yes. Uh, will it give him a real mandate at this point? It's tough to say. Mm. Aisha Gul mentioned, and this is what you hear, I, I live in Turkey usually, this, this issue, this constant issue, I make 8,500 Turkish lira a month. It's the minimum wage. It's like 400-something euros a month. My rent is 400, 500 euros. My electricity is this much. I hear this so much from every single person. And it's a failure of the elite in that country to pay a little bit more than that 8,500 Turkish lira minimum that they refuse to pay. Um, it is a, a dysfunction of the market that People in Turkey are getting Middle East wages, but more and more paying Western European or at least Central European prices for food, for rent, for transportation. Uh, I live it. I feel it. The prices are getting, the, the, you know, the price of stuff like cheese is the same as here, you know, in, in Turkey. And people mm. make 400 euros a month. So it's, it's become tough, and I have a feeling that that issue will overwhelm everything, regardless of who is the president. If I may, if I may just add something. It's not because only because of the inflation, though. It is also because throughout the years, Erdogan and his government have privatized so many things that Turkey was actually, you know, agriculture. Um, you mentioned cheese, so I, I thought about it. So uh, animal products and all this, that we depend so much on the international spectrum in order to have imports and exports that we didn't before. So we live uh, poorly in in a, in a country that we could live off so much better in reality. Mm. Three weeks on, and there's no stopping it, it seems, in Sudan's capital. Warring generals continue their death match while hospitals and looting uh, are, are continue, hospitals are looted and entire neighborhoods empty out, leaving people to fear for the houses they left behind. Each day brings evidence of a fight that was quick to fan out from the capital. These images posted to social media Thursday purportedly from the West Darfur city of El Janina, Darfur, the home of uh, Hameti, the head of the RSF paramilitaries. He's trying to unseat the regular uh, army of junta leader Abdel Fattah uh, al-Buran. And, uh, you know, each day it's become a kind of a grim running joke in the newsroom, Nicholas, about the latest ceasefire announcement that comes to naught. Neither of these guys want to stop fighting. No, they don't. And very... Very sadly for, for Sudan, it's hard to see an end to this war without one of them losing it. Mm. And the problem is they are both incredibly well financed. They're both well resourced in terms of access to petrol, fuel, uh, in terms of you know, smuggling gold to make cash to buy weapons, in terms of having you know, rich and powerful patrons uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere around the world. Um, it is incredibly tough. And as a result, um, it's hard to see a quick end to it. You heard Borza Dargahi saying how uh, nations, when they look at Ukraine and Russia, stay on the sidelines to see who's got the momentum. It seems as though when it comes to Sudan, the, the, the so-called proxies right now are not going all in. Um, everyone is, yeah, as you say, biding their time and, and seeing who might be the, the, the best horse to back. Everyone's got split priorities and, and um, you know, take Russia, for example. They want to get access, you know, to a port, very important for them. But at the same time, so that's, that would su suggest more official, more on the side of the army. But then at the same time, on the side of the RSF, there are links with the Wagner Group um, and a lot of the gold smuggling, which has been very useful for Russia in this time of, uh, of sanctions. Um, and so even... A single um, outside force is split in how it supports Sudan. And, and just to, to go the same way you are, Russia has been betting on both horses, so it's, it is absolutely assured that it will, it will get something out of this war first. And secondly, Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner group, last week, I believe, or no, on April 20th, has been proposing himself has um, a peacemaker instead of UN because he was accusing UN of just wanted to shed more blood from Sudanese people and he was claiming to be uh, belonging to two military order orders of Sudan being just able to get in touch with both warlords and to bring everyone around one table and to get a peace deal. Wherever so there's gold there seems to be 
Uh, all of this Russians. gold, absolutely. Well, um, yeah. Wagner has been trading gold for influence and to for for support to some fighters. So, gold is the main reason why uh, Wagner is involved in the country. That's for sure. Now, Sudan on paper uh, may be a former. Uh, Ottoman and uh, British uh, uh, pr pr protectorate or colony, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it is Egypt's backyard. Yeah. It is Egypt's backyard, but it, it, it's also the Gulf's backyard. And the Gulf uh, countries, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, have had you know tremendous influence there. They're also betting on, they have been betting on horses. But look, and, and, and you know, to be fair, the US and the EU have a you know strong role in in, in Sudan, having you know uh, uh, helped untangle the the war and the separation between South Sudan and and Sudan, but look, you know, no one, none of those international players wanted this war or want this war, and I I would love to be corrected on that. This is not something that anyone, un, unlike other kinds of proxy wars, uh, this is not that kind of thing. Um, but the international community does have influence and it does have responsibility, and its primary responsibility was. Uh, the, the mistake, the tragic mistake of betting on these thugs, I'm sorry, to uh, bring stability to this country instead of the opportunity that it had in 2019 to give power fully to a civilian government. It chose the wrong horse, the international it, community in general. The, the and it, 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 it's a pattern that happens in, in, in countries around the world, especially Africa and the Middle East. So the calculus of the United States particularly was Look, they haven't gone away yet, uh, the, the generals, so why don't you try to share power with them until we can find some kind of solution? It, it was kind of like a, a, the path of least resistance. It would have been much harder to, to really step in and, and clear the generals out and say, no, no, civilians take over now, 2019. Um, and, and you're absolutely right that that was the big betrayal, the big opportunity and the big betrayal. We've seen similar things with the backing of... Uh, Haftar in, in Libya, um, all over North Africa, Middle East, as you say. It, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it is a shame. The EU even cooperated or, or hired Hemeti as someone who can help manage migration flows. So I think, you know, we all have to look in the mirror. Pretty, pretty... Uh, I, I, I think the biggest, worst thing that was done was the Trump administration refusing to um, remove sanctions on Sudan as a, you know, state sponsor of terror, even though they had uh, uh, put the president who had, you know, earned that designation for Sudan in jail until uh, Sudan recognized Israel. Hmm. And so for a year and a half, this country was basically, you know, floating and uh, unstable, people souring on democracy, people souring on the bad economy, um, while the Trump administration waited for some kind of political payback for, for removing that designation. And President Biden was it today, or I think today, also just said that he will actually be putting sanctions on Sudan. But, but as much as we can talk about the outside forces and the betrayals and the opportunities that were lost, um, if we if we take a step back, this remains at least what I see since April 15th, when 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 the war broke in a, in a way in Khartoum, mm. is 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 the same old same old of two men two generals who do not want to let power go and of a people, of a population that are actually more and more, despite all the populism in, in, in the world that is rising, that are that want to be more democratic and to no longer have these men in power for 20 years or 30 years. The thing is that I see only three scenarios possible and none of them right now are options. The peacemaking, no. The, more, the longer it goes on, is it going to go on, the, lo the harder it is to, br to break a deal. And the other thing is basically to let one of the generals win. Right. Dif no, no, easy, no, no easy solutions at this point. If you were thinking of a weekend getaway to London, <laughs> uh, you might find it to be, well, kind of an out-of-time experience. Dateline Waterloo Station. The King's Guards passing the turnstiles for a horseless carriage ride to preparations for the King's coronation on Saturday. Rest assured, horses will indeed feature uh, in the crowning of Charles III. Now, polls may suggest that interest in the monarchy is waning the other side of the channel, but try telling that to the faithful. 
who've been uh, camping out this week, waiting for that moment Saturday when the royal procession passes. It's fabulous. England at its best. It's like Cinderella. There is nobody that does this like us. There isn't another country that really has a monarchy like us. We are just so lucky because we just see the crowd. People from every country. We've spoken to so many people from all over the world. Just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And the good news is we have a subject of his gracious majesty with us. His name is Nicholas Norbrook. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, you, I you, should probably at this point say that I have a French mother as well. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I have a Republican buried not that far from the surface. <laughs> One interesting fact is um, the local elections happened yesterday, uh, possibly a more important fact for the democracy of, of the United Kingdom than the coronation of Charles III, but who knows. Um, but in the, uh, in the ward of um, Windsor, which is where the castle is, where the royal family rebranded themselves as in the House of Windsor, um, uh, just after the around the First World War, um, the pro-royal party, the Tories, lost to the Liberal Democrats. Uh -huh. So I don't know what that means about how much support the monarchy has today in the United Kingdom, but it's certainly a sign. A sign of what? That is the question. Borsu Dargahi. Well, I mean, I, I think that the, right now there are 32 constitutional monarchies in the world. Uh, most of them are uh, European democracies. A lot of people here in France, by the way, say they prefer to have the kind of monarchy they have to the kind we have, where the executive branch of power has too much power. I, I mean, actually, that's many. one of the arguments for monarchy, is that a figure like uh, uh, Viktor Orban or, you know, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan would have been checked by a constitutional monarch. And, you know, in the case of, like, for example, Boris Johnson at one point, he was trying to, you know, uh, uh, basically in a private conversation, declared himself the Fuhrer, he, demanding that people follow his orders. And people push back. And the fact that uh, uh, he is actually not the head of state, but he's the head of government, and there is that distinction, uh, it makes a difference. And some argue that that kind of constitutional monarchy is a, uh, a great antidote against figures like you know, Boris Johnson or a overzealous uh, uh, president with too much executive power in the case of, of uh, criticisms of France. But well, in you... France, you have, a, sorry, I interrupted you, but mm. you have a, a, a President Macron who already thinks of himself as a monarch, as, an, as a king. The, the, just the only thing I, I want to say about this coronation is that he's been, Charles III has been waiting so long mm -hmm. for this moment to arrive. 74 years old. Yes, but also with a, with a mother, Elizabeth, who, who was hanging on as long as she could to power into the throne, that I think Charles is ju just saying, God, don't let me die right now. Mm -hmm. God, don't let me get COVID right now. It's as he, he it's, it's really the, the one thing, it's, it's as if it's the one thing that he's been waiting for all his life. But by the way, what is it with the London underground system making so much uh, news on Thursday? Uh, Prince William and Princess Kate opted for the full commoner experience as they uh, made their way to London's Soho district and a visit to a typical uh, English uh, pub uh, where William was seen, uh, I guess, as all politicians do, drawing a pint at, at one point. Uh, Elsa Vidal, uh, your thoughts on the fact that Let's confess confession time here. There's a yeah. lot of French people paying attention to this. Well, we experience quite a lot of success with the video we have produced on the ahead of the coronation thing. But to to be honest with you, it's very exotic to our view and for our viewers it sounds and yes, very exotic and maybe also it raises the question of how willingly are British citizens paying for all these uh, events that cost so much money, whereas um, they have been experiencing a super high inflation rate? So we are also paying uh, attention to those within the, the United Kingdom who question the fact that they are still paying for monarchy and uh, that they should be getting much more support for the more disenfranchised, for the poorest guys. So I'm, I'm much more... In, I'm much more in favor of questioning these expenses that seem so strange in dire times. I mean, it's a kind of patrimony, no? I mean, you're, you, it's like you're preserving a church or an old building mm -hmm. or a Roman ruin. You know, you're preserving this institution that harkens back 
you know, centuries. There's a, there's, a, I when guess you, there's when a, you look at the you know, money, value, the, value money yeah. the money flows from the British exchequer into their pockets. Um, for example, but, but, to, but to use to use a British expression, they bring in the punters. I mean, there's a lot of people yeah, showing up in London, people, and people make the argument, and, and also people maybe they could do it cheaper. Looking, yeah, they certainly could. This was an opportunity, I think, to reform, maybe not abolish, but reform the monarchy. And I don't think they've seized that opportunity. Okay, at all. there is going to be in Saturday's ceremony, and I can't let you get away without asking you this <laughs> question. Uh, in the old days, you would have the homage of the peers uh, pledging their allegiance to the new uh, monarch. Uh, this time, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury will let anyone around the country, if they so choose, uh, pay allegiance to his majesty. And put it on Snapchat? or They, they may get you know, much more than they bargain for if they open the mic up to, to the general public. Um, will you be paying allegiance to uh, I'm going to be in Paris, sadly. I'm not going to be able to make it. So no, but you can do it from around the country. You can put it on your TikTok. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, certainly investigate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, that was a non-answer, but I, know, I noted that. Nicholas Norbrook, I want to thank you so much. Thank you very much. Aisha Gulsert, Borzu Dargai, Elsa Vidal. Thank you. thank you for being with us here for The World This Week.